Hi guys, how you doing? It's Ranger Martin here from the Dinosaur Experience. I hope you're having a great Friday. I know I am. It's fantastic. It's the weekend. It's what we all look forward to. And for us, it means we've got a chance to come to some of your birthdays again this weekend. All right, we've got a great show lined up for you today. It's going to be absolutely packed. We don't have a dinosaur today because we've got something really special. We've got an interview um, with a paleontologist who's going to tell us all about his work. Um, so let's have a little look. So we're, let me show you what we're going to be doing today. Um, so the first thing we're doing, we're doing our riddle of the day, like we always do. We're going to get the grey matter going, see if we can get thinking. We're going to do some birthday shout outs. Then we're going to go into our interview with uh, Benjamin Berger, our paleontologist his friend. Uh, we've got some announcements and then we're going to have a look around the web. Now, just a quick reminder for you guys, we're actually live at the moment. If you're watching us live, thank you so much. If you can do me a favour so that I can test my systems and know that people are hearing us and seeing us, if you can give us a thumbs up. Now, you might be on YouTube, you might be on Facebook, either in the Dinosaur Experience group or the Dinosaur Experience page or my own personal page. Um, you could be on LinkedIn or you could be watching us on Twitter. But wherever you are, do me a favor, give us a thumbs up or make a quick comment in there um, and then I'll see that it's actually working and I can see stuff that comes in. Talking about comments, if you want me to give you a shout out at the end of the show, like we always do, if you want to add your name in the comments there um, and your age or your child's name or age, put them in there and we'll get to them at the end and we'll be able to give them a good shout out. All right, let's move on. So the first thing we're looking at today, the riddle of the day. Let's see if we can get the grey matter going, see if we can get thinking. So here it is. What is so fragile that just saying its name will break it? What is so fragile that just saying its name will break it? What do you think, guys? Anybody got any ideas on that? Have a little think, see if you know. Uh, if you think you know the answer, put it in the chat there and we'll see um, We'll see what we can see and see if anybody gets it right. All right, let's have a look at the birthdays from this weekend. Had two birthdays this weekend. First one was Graham uh, in Lake Charles on Saturday. We went to see Graham and all his friends. What a fantastic party. Had a huge dinosaur bounce house. Um, Nash was trying to get in there, but we wouldn't let him in the bounce house. I'm sure he would have burst it. But we had a great time down there in Lake Charles. Thank you so much for inviting us, and I hope you had a fantastic birthday, Graham. And the next one was on Sunday. We went to see Harrison. Um, Harrison was three. We went to see him in Prairieville. We brought along Nash and Rexy. We had a fantastic time meeting all you guys, and I hope you had as much fun as we did. Now, on Tuesday, we did something a little bit different. We came to see the Albany Lower Elementary School. Uh, it's the second time we've been there, and we had such great fun. The kids were absolutely fantastic, full of questions. They really got into it. They loved Rexy, even when he was being very mischievous. And, of course, we brought Brutus as well, who's our brand-new Carnotaurus, and he was a bit of a star. He was the star of the show. So thank you, guys, at the Albany Lower Mellet lower elementary school we had a fantastic time with you guys thank you for having us all right i don't want to hang around too much because uh what we've got coming up now is absolutely fantastic let me tell you if you are um or your child has any interest at all in being a paleontologist listen very closely to this interview get your pen and your paper out um we're going we're gonna to go through it. Um, Benjamin gives you some real good tips. And right at the end, we cover what he believes a good career path would be or several different career paths into paleontology. It's a question that a lot of people ask all the time. Well, my child wants to be a paleontologist. How can he do it? What's the best route? Well, that's the questions that we were asking uh, Benjamin. And this is the interview. So sit back, get your pen out. Enjoy. Okay, so what we're going to do now, guys, really exciting. We've got a real paleontologist waiting to talk to us. His name is Benjamin, and I want to say, hello, Benjamin. How are you doing today? Hello. It's I'm doing great. Good. It's really good to see you. Thank you so much for spending your time with us. I know time is the most valuable asset any of us have, um, and we really appreciate your time for being here. So thank you for that. Well, thanks for inviting me. This is a pleasure to, to have a conversation with you today and talk about paleontology and dinosaurs. Excellent. 
Excellent. Well, that's what we love. So first question I have, what, what's your, so tell us about your current job and, and what does it entail? What do you actually do? Yeah, so I'm a professor. I'm an associate professor at uh, Utah State University um, in their Uinta Basin campus, which is located just about, I don't know, about 15 minutes from Dinosaur National uh, Monument. Um, I, uh, I teach um, basically college students. Uh, last night, I finished up teaching um, a class I teach on dinosaurs called the Natural History of Dinosaurs. Um, I also teach a lot of uh, uh, freshman college students um, various courses in science and geology. Um, so I teach not only about dinosaurs, but I also teach about other uh, extinct animals, both invertebrates and vertebrates. Um, and I also teach uh, students about the rocks that uh, dinosaurs are found in um, and also explore um, uh, classes on like paleoclimate and understanding the environment um, that not only dinosaurs lived in, but other creatures at other geological times in the past. Um, and so my typical day is, uh, is, is a lot of preparing lectures, uh, teaching, reading scientific papers, um, basically putting together uh, uh, classes. Um, and now I've been teaching a lot of online classes and uh, kind of broadcast classes as well, kind of similar to this. So, um, so I'm always, and I got students distributed across the state of Utah. Um, so I have students in, uh, down in Moab, um, our main campus is in Logan, and I teach here in Vernal. So, and many of those areas have um, uh, fantastic uh, deposits of dinosaurs and prehistoric creatures. And um, our university is really cool in that we have a museum on one of our campus in Price, the Prehistoric Museum um, that's in Price, Utah. Um, that's a fantastic dinosaur museum. Um, I also work with people at the Utah Fieldhouse Museum, which is here in Vernal, which is another fantastic uh, dinosaur um, collection. Um, so if you're in Utah, those are two, um, especially Eastern Utah, those are two really fun museums to visit, especially if you're interested. In and they're, they're open to the public, so the public can come and see those? Yeah, and they're both run by the state, one by the university and one by the state government as a, as a um, state museum. and um they they feature quite a few cool uh uh dinosaurs uh the one in price has a fabulous collection of ankylosaurs um and uh on display as well as some really nice allosaur uh stegosaurus some of the morrison uh, formation dinosaurs and the one in vernal has a, a beautiful display <clears throat> it's got an allosaurus hippocampusaurus um stegosaurus <clears throat> And then uh, Dippy the, the the Plotticus, they have a cast of it that was one of the ones that Andrew Carnegie made uh, back in the day that was found in Dinosaur National Monument. And right. if if you are into dinosaurs, you have to visit Dinosaur National Monument. This is the place to be in terms of incredible uh, bones that are still in the rock. Um, it's a site that's been excavated beginning in 1909, and it's a really cool bone bed. Um, and it's open to the public and it's a really cool place to explore. I dragged my parents to go see it when I was nine years old. And um, many of the students that I teach got inspired by going to Dinosaur National Monument as kids and getting an interested in paleontology. Amazing. Yeah. So, so tell me about, you said the Dinosaur National Monument, that's actually, that's like a rock formation you can go to and see them actually in the rock. Is that right? Yeah, this is a site that was, it's uh, located, um, um, close to the Colorado border, kind of in the corner of, of, of Utah. And it was discovered by um, a fellow named um, Earl Douglas. Uh, Earl Douglas was hired by Andrew Carnegie um, back in the early 1900s to go west and find dinosaurs. And <clears throat> Carnegie was setting up a museum in Pittsburgh and he wanted dinosaurs. And at that time, all the dinosaurs were either at the Peabody Museum or at the American Museum in New York or down in Philadelphia. And he wanted to put some dinosaurs on display. And he sent Earl Douglas um, out west. And Earl Douglas came out to this part of Utah, which at that time, there weren't any dinosaurs that had been discovered yet. And he went up a kind of a little ravine and um, started and discovered a bunch of um, sauropod vertebrae that were dipping down into the ground. 
And there's a famous picture of him standing next to it. Um, and so they started excavating it. Um, and initially they put in a mining claim to excavate the dinosaur bones, but the government's like, uh, you know, these are dinosaurs. We should open this up, try to make it into some sort of park or some sort of um, a national monument, which is what it what ended up happening. So um, many of the, they started working on it in 1909. And the Carnegie Museum, I think, worked on it until about the 1930s. Um, and then during the Great Depression, uh, the United States government actually hired people to come out and help dig up dinosaurs for pay during oh, the Great Depression. And it was during that time when they had a lot of people, a lot of workers that were out of work um, to help with the excavation, that they actually excavated quite a bit more of the hillside. Um, and they were pulling out all of these amazing dinosaurs, Diplodocus, Apatosaurus, Camarasaurus. Um, uh, they found some Allosaurus specimens up there, Stegosaurus, all these classic kind of iconic uh, Jurassic dinosaurs. And many of them ended up getting distributed to various museums around the world. Um, and they would make casts of them or they would actually tra you know, send certain uh, dinosaurs. So if you ever in Denver, um, their, uh, their big um, uh, dinosaur, sauropod dinosaur is from Dinosaur National Monument, um, uh, Dippy the, the Diplodocus, um, which was on display in London, yes. came from that locality. And so, so it's a really cool place. And so eventually um, they decided to leave some of the bones in the rock um, so that people could come and see how they were collected. And so they quit, quit working on that rock face. Um, but what's interesting about it is that they, um, so they kind of quit there, but then they started finding dinosaurs up along that ridge too. So they've had a number of interesting discoveries that have been made along that whole area. And if you go, um, there is a quarry that you, you can uh, go up to. There's a visitor center. You can take a little tram or drive up to the, to the quarry itself, which is kind of enclosed now to help protect it from the weathering. But there's a wonderful trail that you can take called the Discovery Trail. And um, it's kind of hidden. But if you're up there, if you go on that little trail, um, on the opposite side is another ridge that's filled with dinosaur bones that they haven't even excavated yet. So... Oh. If they want, they could excavate more if they if they ever wanted to, um, and uh, pull out more dinosaurs. So um, they haven't right now, but you know there is there is a possibility in the future, and it's fun to go over in that side because you can see um, how the bone really looked like before the you know you start excavating. So you can see if you can see the bones. They mark a couple of them so, so visitors can see them, but it's really cool. So yeah, yeah, because I can imagine good... as a as an untrained eye. It's, it's kind of hard to spot what you're looking for. You know, once you've been doing it for a while, and I'm sure you know what to look for. So for general public, that's a fantastic sort of insight into, into what real paleontology is all about. Yeah, definitely. And the bones are disarticulated. They're all split apart. Okay. So when you go there, you look at these bones and you go, okay, what, what bone is that? Which dinosaur did it belong to? Um, they have a little key there that you could figure out. And that's what I do with my students. I take them up. And I say, okay, you have to find all the bones for this dinosaur and this dinosaur and this dinosaur and mark which ones are present on the rock. Gotcha. They're, they're all disarticulated. There were there have been a few um, articulated skeletons that have been found there. The most famous one, I think, is the camera source that's um, they have a cast there, but they're actual specimens in Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh. Okay. And it's a, um, it's a juvenile sauropod dinosaur that's that was i think there was only one bone that was kind of out of place but it's a almost completely articulated skeleton um they did find um an allosaurus a few years back the funny thing about the allosaurus is there it's articulated and they were working on it and they got up to the head and they couldn't find the head oh, no. the skull so they were all kind of bummed out but they kept kind of you know, working, working, working a little bit further into the rock. And this rock is hard, really hard rock. Um, so it's tough to prepare. And they got about, I don't know, about a meter away from the, the rest of the skeleton. And they found the skull. Oh, so wow. they did find it. And so they were able to, <laughs> to pull it out. So, so when an animal dies, of course, it starts to disarticulate. The bones will start to disarticulate and move along. And this is an ancient river 
bed. So a lot of these bones, the animals had died upstream, up the river, and they died and they started to decay. The bones uh, um, scattered apart and then they were drifted down and got buried. Um, so actually so find the skull. That's because uh, from my understanding, the skulls are, are pretty rare. They're the hardest things to find yeah. on, on fossils, aren't they? So yeah. Uh, and he actually found that the skull. That's that's incredible. That's oh man, you you made me. That's on the bucket list now. I've got to come now. I've got to come and find it, come and see it, and 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 visit it. So so that's all stuff that we can see in the field. What about yourself? Do you ever work in the field? Is that something you've done, or do you do regular? Yeah. yeah so I. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background about my experiences, mm -hmm. some of the career paths in paleontology. Um, I um, So prior to being a professor, I worked as a paleontology consultant, where I spend almost all my time in the field. Um, nowadays, I usually go out um, and do collections in the summertime. Um, I've been working on a variety of different projects and with different um, other um, scientists, um, including geologists, um, chemists, um, various other people, biologists who work kind of in other fields. Um, and I've worked a lot in this tri-state area of Utah, Colorado, and Southwest Wyoming. Um, and I've been working, I've been, a lot of my students work in the Jurassic or Cretaceous uh, periods. I've been working a little bit down in the Triassic, and I've been also working in the Cenozoic uh, in the time period after the extinction of the dinosaurs. Okay the Paleocene and the Eocene as well. So looking for, um, uh, in the Cenozoic, I, I look for a lot of um, extinct uh, mammals that survived the, the extinction event, um, which I find kind of fun and interesting. The one nice thing about working with mammals is that they are, they are much smaller. <laughs> and so one of the challenges of dinosaurs is when you find them, they get they're pretty enormous and so it takes a lot of time and heavy equipment to excavate a dinosaur so um, for a sauropod dinosaur it could be like five or six years before you get it out of the ground and it's constant work arranging for um, heavy equipment and stuff to come in and work on that um, so prior to being a professor i worked in the field as a consultant what a consultant does is um, i would get called out on projects that they were building say a road or a big pipeline. A lot of times they did a lot of road work. So they're building a highway or expanding a highway and they're going through like dinosaur bearing rocks or they're going through um, something in which there's, there's their chance of finding really cool fossils. And so they'll have a paleontologist go out and kind of assess whether they'll find a dinosaur or not. Um, and if there is a chance, then you go out on the crew, the construction crew and that way, if they uncover, and sometimes they do, they found a sauropod here uh, not too long ago um, on a pipeline project. So if they uncover something, then you're there to like salvage it and try to get it all cleaned up and prepped and 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 then into a museum so people can study it and come and see it. I can, I can uh, imagine the, the pressure on that because, you know, they're building a pipeline or whatever it is. They want to get done, but all of a sudden they hit something that's really important. Is, is there... You know, like you've got you've got two days to get this out, or it, does it does the whole thing stop, or how does it work? Yeah, the, it's kind of interesting because a lot of times what ends up happening um, is it depends. Sometimes they'll hit something really amazing, and they'll be like, "All right, can you go around this, and we can work on this while you work on that." Um, a lot of times, what ends up happening is that you are working with like the rubble of the stuff that they've dug uh, through, okay. and you pick up something. Um, and it's, and, and you look down and it's, and it's an amazing, uh, fossil. Um, I've seen machines that will be going along, you know, the countryside and it's kicking up all these, this, the dirt and everything. And all of a sudden you'll see a bunch of pile of bones and you're like, wait, wait, we ran into something. <laughs> um, there's a, there's a famous specimen at Dinosaur National Monument in the old days, they would use dynamite to blow up stuff. Oh and there was a kid that was up there to see the big explosion as they were detonating the dynamite into the hillside. And um, after they had cleared off the area, he came running in and he looked down and one of the blocks that they had blown off um, had this amazing little, uh, um, it looks like a little lizard with all these weird little scales. It's a relative to um, a, 
it's an archosaur relative to crocodiles that live today. And it's little, it's a little, little specimen that they have on display. You can get a little cast at the visitor center that he found wow. it, um, that they prepped it up. And it's really, really an incredible thing. And, you know, he just had really sharp eyes. I mean, kids, kids are fantastic at finding fossils because they have the down, down close to the ground. You're looking around, they're able to pick up things and look at things. Um, and so uh, often many really incredible dinosaur discoveries have been made by kids. That's, so. that's amazing. And, and, you know, we did a show yesterday on, on Mary Anning and she was 11 when she discovered, you know, a lot of her fossils and that sort of thing. So, yeah, it's, it's a, I don't know what it, well, I do know what it is with dinosaurs. I think, I think with kids and dinosaurs, it's very much the case that the kids love the fact that these things were real. You know, you can like unicorns and you can like dragons and they're cool, but dinosaurs were here. They're actually real things that were around. And that, I think that's the main attraction for people like myself. And I'm sure it's one of the things that kids love as well is the fact that these things were, were here and with us. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of weird too. The thing that attracted me, I think, the most about paleontology, um, when I was a kid, I grew up in the in the Rocky Mountains. And um, when I was about I don't know, really young, I found a fossil shell of a Cretaceous um, marine little bivalve, a little clam. And I remember showing it, I think probably to my mom, and she's like, oh, that was that's a fossil shell that listed in oceans here and of course there's mountains all around sure me. and i was like wait a second how did this whole area be under an ocean back you know a hundred million years ago like where did the where did these mountains come from what did the landscape look like it must have been totally different than it looks like today yeah. um and so that really opened my eye to like the depth of geological time that we stand on uh-huh so that really got me excited um, uh, about learning more about paleontology, learning about dinosaurs, learning about you know other extinct creatures, um, starting to go out and collect. I became an avid rock hound and going out and collecting um, fossils and things that I could find. You know, lots of times I was interested in in pretty crystals and things like that. Visit all the rock shops and stuff, um, and that really inspired me. I think in in interest in paleontology and figuring out like what did the world really look like you know sure. 100 million years ago 200 million years ago 300 million years ago what were the cre creatures look like as they were running around so yeah so it's that's really fun the other thing i love about paleontology is that it's a detective story um you are solving a mystery and sometimes the mystery um takes you into dead ends and sometimes it's not it's it it's really addictive in terms of like you might have just a scrap of bone or you might be trying to track down a an old fossil locality that someone discovered a hundred years ago and you're kind of you're you're looking at all these clues trying to figure out all these things and oftentimes the the clues you're given are tantalizingly like very small so um Last night I was talking to my my students and I was showing them some some bones. They had to identify some bones, right? And a lot of the bones that you find are really fragmentary. And they were all like, "How how much of a dinosaur do you need?" <laughs> I mean, these things are like you're showing us this fragments of these bones and stuff. It, we can't even tell where it belongs in a dinosaur. So how do you how do you know? And I said, "Well, a lot of it's just." spending a lot of time looking at the skeletons of, of these animals, uh, looking in the museum, you know, hunting around in old museum collections, looking at old labels, looking at, um, you know, all this information and uh, tracking down what that bone really represents. And sometimes, a lot of times you're making guesses in terms of like what it could be. And then you go back and you try to find where it was found and look for more. Because every time you discover a new fossil, you add a new piece to the puzzle. So it's kind of addictive. This is a detective story. You're trying to figure out like what, was, what were the creatures living there? What was going on? Um, and that's that to me is really fun. It's like being a Sherlock Holmes sort of character. Yeah, right? I can imagine. Because you, you, you're making your own story around or trying to find the story of what it is you've found. It's amazing. So... 
of all the things you've done and seen and found, is there anything that you can particularly remember that, that re- excites you? Any great stories that you want to tell us? Oh, let's see. Um, yeah. So I've, I've made some really fun discoveries over the years. Um, and one of the f- fun stuff is kind of like the, um, when you find something that hasn't been found before. So a lot of times you'll be out doing field work um, and I got this last summer, we found a, a really cool little skeleton of a, of a creature. And at first I thought, um, it might be something. So I was kind of excited we started prepping it up and it ended up being something else. And, um, the funny thing about this specimen I've been prepping, I call it the, the ball of bones because I was hoping it was an articulated skeleton. Um, and what it is, is, um, it's a little, it's a mammal, it's a little mammal, um, and when when we found it on the outcrop eroding out, we found I found some post craniaceous sort of elements to it, and a, a couple of femurs, two femurs, um, found a tibia. We started finding more and more. And as you work your way into the hillside, uh, and you start getting into the rock itself that hasn't eroded out, uh, you get really excited when you haven't found the skull, right? So you know that the skull is in there. So we stopped, chopped into it, and sure enough, we found the top of the skull. So I took it back. I thought it was, um, I thought it was a creodont. It ended up um, having uh, started prepping it out and, and looking at the teeth. Um, I noticed that it has this really interesting character of having the tibia and the fibula fused um, at the distal end, which is kind of weird. Um, but it's found in a group called the um, panelestids. And these were like little otter-like mammals. They're totally extinct today, um, unrelated to modern otters. Um, and these guys, um, are kind of related to the, um, simulestids that were running around during the late, uh, Cretaceous. And, um, there's some beautiful skeletons that have been found in the Green River Formation. And so this was kind of, kind of unique there. They have been found in the area we were working at. So, but there's lots of other skeletons of them that are out there. So a lot of times you're trying to find kind of bits and pieces of, of a skeleton that people haven't found before, like a new species. Um, and so, um, so super excited about that specimen. Um, but a couple of years ago, we found a jaw of, so it's not a skeleton, it's just a jaw. And we also found a humerus of a weird um, pig-like creature. Um, and it ended up being a new genus and species of this really archaic family. Um, and it kind of pushed push down this idea of the origin of some of these uh, what are called artiodactyls, even ho- toad ungulate sort of animals a little bit further back in time. Um, so sometimes that's more exciting because no one had found that thing, but it's not as complete as a specimen we're working on downstairs. That's uh, much more complete, but there are other skeletons of it. Gotcha. So sometimes you'll find something like, you know, an allosaurus or something and you find just a part of it and you get really excited, but then you kind of get back to the museum and they're like, oh, they have a lot of Allosaurus specimens here, <laughs> you know, try to fit it in. So, um, yeah, this recently, this last week, I've also been working on a, um, a really interesting um, dinosaur discovery, and I've been trying to kind of track down it. Um, uh, and what what spurred me to get interested in this was a, a colleague of mine um, has been working in um, in over in Colorado, and she has um, she was working on the geology of this uh, camp that she works at, and she emailed me and she said, "Do you have any interesting stuff about it?" And I said, "Well, I do. Um, there's this dinosaur discovery that was made over there, and." I've been really puzzled about where it was found. Um, and it was found in, uh, 1869. In fact, it was the first dinosaur that was discovered in Colorado. And it's a, it's a really fragmentary bone and it was sent back East, um, and presented to Joseph Leidy, um, who was the first vertebrate paleontologist. He's famous for working on Hadrosaurus and some of the New Jersey dinosaurs. And, um, and later kind of got involved in a lot of these fossils to describe they were coming from the American West as, as, as the surveyors were working. And um, Joseph Leidy recognizes a dinosaur. Um, and this is pretty early on in the, the history of, of paleontology. Um, 
and he gave it a, a new genus and species name, um, um, Anthrodermis, which we don't use today. And I'll tell you why, because it's okay. a really fragmentary fossil. It's only like a part of a bone of a color vertebrae. And um, in fact, Richard Owen, the guy who coined the term dinosauria, uh, I found a quote of his that basically said, what are you thinking, Joseph Lighty? Why are you naming this a new species? It's just a fragment of a bone. There's nothing <laughs> diagnostic of this thing. Um, and it was it's in the Smithsonian collection. Years later, the, in 1920, the, the curator of dinosaurs, Charles Gilmore, uh, worked on it. And he's like, yeah, I think it's an Allosaurus. I think it's an Allosaurus tail or the tail of an Allosaurus. And so people have just kind of discounted it. What the interesting thing is that no other dinosaurs have been found in that area since that discovery. So um, I've always wondered if where it came from, mm -hmm. uh, if it might have come from the Cretaceous or the Jurassic, where, because um, it was supposedly given to Ferdinand Hayden, who was a surveyor um, who came over then. Um, and so I've been tracking down the archives to trying to figure out who was the person that gave him the bone and where did they collect it from? Sure. Um, and so I'm going down a lot of leads, looking at some of these um, archival newspapers, report, uh, government reports. Um, the surveys would make maps, um, going through some of the um, archives with the, the old lands grant. So when people would actually go out and do land surveys of the area, um, looking at all of their records to try to track down where the specimen might have actually come from. So there's a lot of detective work involved in that. And the idea is that we could go back there and find find some dinosaur bones and, and figure out exactly where this specimen came from. If one if one bone came from yes. that area, there's probably more in the ground. That's right. So, yeah. yeah. And that's like you were saying, that's the detective part of it. Not only are you trying to find out what kind of animal or what kind of dinosaur it was, what what prehistoric creature it was, you've got to find out where it was from, who discovered it, when it was discovered, all that sort of thing. You know, that's such a mystery. And there's little clues everywhere, I imagine. And you've got to just got to find those. Yeah. That's and sometimes, yeah, a lot of, there's another funny story. I was working up in Wyoming and um, there was a, a old scientific paper that I had of a, where a fossil locality was I was trying to find in the middle of nowhere. And all I had to go on was a picture that was taken of the locality. So we oh, were what? out there like with a picture trying to match up all the hillsides, you know, to see where it was. And the funny thing was that we were, we were wandering around. We could not find where this fossil locality was. And somebody on the crew had left their jacket out when we got back to camp and I said, oh, I know where that is. I'm going to run and get it. So I ran and got their jacket where we had stopped for lunch and I was running back and I decided to take a different route and just a quicker route back to camp. And I'm running along and I look over and I'm like, Oh, that's the hillside. And I grabbed the piece of paper with the, the photograph on it and matched it up. And I'm like looking down, I'm like, this is it. We found it. And I came running back into camp and I was like, we found it. We found it. And uh, luckily, they had actually taken a stake and they had put a stake down on the ground where they had where the locality was. So I knew it was the locality because they had a stake that was there and it matched up perfectly. And we started finding fossils, too. So um, so a lot of a detective work. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's like it's almost Indiana Jones, isn't it? It's it's like that yeah. sort of thing. It's like if you if you saw it in a movie, you'd be like, no, that would never happen. But it's it's for real. That's so cool. So so. I know there's lots of children watching, um, you know, hundreds, thousands of children are really interested in paleontology and, you know, they've got their, their interest in dinosaurs. So what I wanted to ask you, one of the main things that I am always thinking about is what's the career path, you know, from a, from a young child to becoming someone like yourself, what's the career path to, to become a paleontologist? Yeah, so there's lots of different career paths. Um, to become a professional paleontologist. And um, one of the things that um, uh, I've kind of experienced in my career path of going through this is just the persistence of being interested in paleontology. Um, oftentimes, as kids, we're super excited about being a paleontologist and really interested in about studying dinosaurs and learning as much as we can about dinosaurs. Um, and that that enthusiasm has to remain and keep passionate about it, even as you get into high school um, and then eventually when you go to college. And oftentimes in high school and college is when uh, 
when kids get kind of less enthusiastic about paleontology. So you have to keep that enthusiasm. And that's the key thing. So as a kid, read as much as you can about dinosaurs, visit museums, um, go out and explore yourself. Um, I, I furnace my, my, I fed my furnace of interest in paleontology by like reading as much as I can about, um, fossils, um, visiting museums. I love museums and seeing, uh, uh, dinosaurs on display, dragging my parents out into the field to, you know, to take me to look at, you know, various rocks whenever we go on a trip, um, stop and look at the geology. Um, and that really made me passionate about it. When I got to college, um, and it, when you when you go off to college to become a paleontologist, which is typically necessary, um, you want to find a college that has a paleontologist that's there on you know teaching. So, um, and not all universities do. So, when you're applying to school to a college, look to see if they have a paleontologist, and that's what I ended up doing. Um, a lot of my my parents were like, "You should go here. You should go there," and I'd I'd walk up and say. Do you have a, do you teach paleontology? And they'd be like, no, I'm like, no, I'm not going there. <laughs> so, um, so that's, I went to, um, to the university of Colorado and I got there a little bummed out because I had to take all these, like, you know, these classes that I didn't think were related to paleontology. I had to take chemistry and physics and biology. And now as I, I realized that that stuff is really important, uh, uh, chemistry, biology and physics are really important for uh, paleontology as well as geology itself. So you take basically the four main sciences, you take as many classes as you can. And so I was taking a lot of chemistry, um, getting through a lot of physics, uh, biology, a lot of biology classes and a lot of geology classes. So studying things like mineralogy, um, ecology, uh, you know, mammalogy, herpetology, all the ologies, right? Um, and then, then I was also taking paleontology. Um, the next thing I did that I highly recommend is I started volunteering at the museum. I worked as a docent, which is like taking kids on tours around the museum, uh, which you learn a lot about dinosaurs because the kids, every, every kid knows as much, a lot more than you think you know. So even at that age, I was like, wow, the kids are sharp. So they keep me on my toes. I also worked in the collections um, and I kind of proved to, to my professors that I was really into this. And so they invited me out to do some field work. And so I started doing field work with them um, and, and, and fell in love with field work and being out in the field. Um, and then after I graduated, my career went in kind of a slightly different direction. Um, I realized when I graduated that I wanted to learn more about anatomy and um, I felt like, yeah, it's taking all these geology classes, chemistry classes and stuff, but I wanted to know anatomy really well. And uh, so I went to graduate school to work with an anatomist in an anatomy program. And the, uh, the professor I was working with worked on dinosaurs and did paleontology, but he also taught at a dental school at a, in a medical program. And so, um, which is weird, it sounds weird, but one of the trajectories, career trajectories of, um, of, of people interested in paleontology, especially dinosaurs, um, is to work as an anatomist. Um, Richard Owen, who came, came up with the term dinosauria, uh, was a professor of surgery in London. Mm -hmm. So Joseph Leidy was a professor of anatomy at the University of, of Pennsylvania. Um, and so there's a long history of paleontologists working, uh, teaching anatomy, uh, both to surgeons and to medical doctors. And there's a reason for that, because a lot of the biology that's taught nowadays is all about um, DNA and molecular and cellular biology, you know, the really small, you know, microbial sort of stuff of, 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 um, of biology. And paleontologists are really good at figuring out that that bone belongs to this bone and where it fits in the skeleton, right? Sure. So they often seek out be, to be trained in anatomy. So I got a degree in anatomy. Um, 
I didn't like that sort of like, cause it's, it's pretty gooey. You're, you're working on dissections. We would dissect crocodiles and dissect um, humans and dissect other animals. So in the cadaver lab, we were working on all sorts of stuff. You're looking at like how the, how the muscles fit onto the bones, all that sort of stuff. And working a lot alongside a lot of people who are going to be surgeons or could be medical doctors. Um, and then in the summers, we would go out and do field work. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, and so a lot of people would keep that as a career. And I have many friends that work in, um, in the medical field at teaching anatomy. And then they, in the summers, they go out and do field work. And so they'll teach like, um, limb bones or uh, limb anatomy, um, or they may be interested in skull anatomy. And then in the summer, they'll go out and dig up dinosaurs and stuff. Um, and that's very common. That's another career path that a lot of people go down uh, in paleontology. After I got that degree, um, I came out west and I got my PhD actually back in geology, which I kind of like. I'm more of a rock person than um, a gooey anatomy person. <laughs> so I felt a little bit more comfortable in, uh, in working with rocks. Um, when I graduated, um, I ended up working as a consultant, I said. So another career path for a lot of people, especially the people that are interested in rocks, is to become a, uh, a paleontology consultant. And um, that career path is slightly different. Usually it doesn't require a PhD, it just requires maybe a master's degree, which allows you to get a lot of permits with the government. Um, you can also work with the government too, like the BLM or the Forest Service or with the National Park Service. And all of those types of land management jobs is where you're going out in the field and you're documenting, you're finding dinosaurs, documenting them, uh, writing up reports about the conservation, um, salvaging stuff when they're doing a highway project, something like that. Um, and so kind of keeping a record, oftentimes you're working um, with, uh, uh, um, they'll, they'll do like a land survey and they want to know where are the dinosaurs, where are we going to find dinosaurs in this area? Where, where do we need to be watching out for, uh, for different things? Um, and so you, you need a lot of reports and stuff, and that's a different career path. A lot of the, uh, my students that go into that sort of career path, um, will take classes on how to make maps. So they, they get a certificate in GIS, which is geographic information system. So map making, um, <laughs> localities, managing the land, um, being able to track down the different rock layers and where you're going to find dinosaurs and where you're not going to find dinosaurs and, and that sort of uh, work. And that, that involves a lot of travel too. So you might be traveling up to Montana the next week you're traveling down, you know, to, to Nebraska. Um, so you're traveling a lot depending on the, on the project. And, sure. and so you got to learn that geology really well. Uh, really fast. So if you like the rock end of things, that's another career path for you. Sure. Um, uh, after my master's, I worked for five years at a museum. And that's a, that's a third track way you can go as a paleontologist, actually working in a museum. And there's kind of uh, three types of jobs in, in a museum setting. There's a preparator. A preparator is the person that's going to prepare the fossils when they're brought back in the field. And a lot of my students get really fascinated about being a preparator. They tend not to pay very well, and they're and they tend to be uh, geared to someone who's extremely patient. <laughs> because you're, you could be sitting on on a block of dinosaur for months, years on end, working on preparing it, wow. and it requires a lot of dedication, a lot of just like going in every day and chipping off a little bit more of the rock. Um, there was a stegosaurus that was pulled out of Garden City, uh, Colorado, uh, when I was young. And um, Donna Engard, who worked on prepping that thing, I think she worked 10 years on it. It's a beautiful specimen. And, um, but it took 10 years of prepping, <laughs> like, because it's huge. It's a complete skeleton. So uh, it, 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 it's, you have to be dedicated to it. Um, it's fun, though. It's a fun work. You do, um, a lot of times you can do fabrication and casting. Um, as a preparator. So you'll take the actual specimens and make casts of the bones that can be mounted for a museum. Um, a lot of preparators come with an art background. So they're interested in doing like the, the artwork associated with it. 
there's a lot of artists, um, which is kind of a separate field than the preparators, but they, they can do sort of the, um, uh, the artwork, the molding, the fabrication, all of that sort of stuff. Um, and there are a few companies out there that, that help to um, design and build mounted skeletons of dinosaurs. Um, and those, that's another career path you can kind of go down into. Um, the other job at a museum that, that's a, kind of a fun job, I think, and that's being a collection manager. Um, and so that person is in charge of the collections of all the dinosaurs. So when the fossils are brought into the museum, they accession them, they keep track of where they are. They write out, usually it's entering stuff into databases, it's, it's taking pictures of them, it's documenting them, keeping track of them. A lot of it involves moving specimens when they have to move a bunch of dinosaurs from one end of the building to the other end, or they're, they're building an addition and they want to move it, they need to move it into the addition. So oftentimes you're moving stuff with dinosaurs, it's often with a forklift <laughs> as you move these big giant bones around the museum. Um, and so that's, that's a lot, of, there's a lot of work involved in that. Um, and that's kind of fun, especially if you're more less into interacting with people and you kind of want to just sit down and work on stuff mm -hmm. um, and you can discover lots of really amazing stuff. I kind of worked as a collection manager at the American Museum. And what I loved about it was that you learn, you learn the fossils really well because you're going into the collections and seeing all the bones and you start learning about um, all the famous collectors, what they collected, where they were. Um, so it's a really good education for, mm -hmm. for figuring out things later on. Um, and then the third job is the curator. The curator is like the face of the museum. So they are publishing, they're researching about the dinosaurs, they're publishing papers, they're getting grants to do scientific expeditions, they're giving traveling, giving talks, uh, they're interacting with the public, um, representing the museum. Oftentimes, they're even doing the financial sort of end of the museum, trying to keep it afloat with grants, uh, donations, working with various people, um, visitors. And so there's sort of the more public face of sure. the museum. And a lot of museums have an educator now, too, that kind of works as like, you know, someone that takes around uh, people in the museum. Um, I have a lot of friends that work as educators who are interacting with the public um, down in the displays and, and teaching people about dinosaurs. So, um, and that brings me to probably my last career path, and that's becoming a professor and teaching at a university. Um, and that's, that's a really rewarding thing because you get to work with students. Um, oftentimes you're leading your own, your own expeditions in the summertime. So a lot of times you have your summers off, which is nice. Um, I have many friends that are high school teachers that, that are paleontologists and they do field work just as in the same and they bring out their high school students. So you don't have to be at a college, you can be at a high school um, and, and uh, be interested in paleontology, be able to take people out in the field um, and get students, you know, even, even in uh, high school, interested in paleontology. And there's always a lot of interest of that. So sure. um, they may teach other classes, they may teach geology or physics and, and chemistry at the high school level. But it's, uh, yeah, they'll, if they can swing it, they'll teach paleontology too, which is really cool. So, so, yeah. so as a young child, from what I, you know, like the, the little bits I got from that, that, that stuck with me was be interested in other things like biology and, and geology and rocks and, and learn as much about that as you can. Um, get yourself into uh, museums and volunteer. That's That was another thing, another way, because um, truth be told, in this world, it's all about people. It's not about money. It's not about anything else. It's about people. The more people you know, the more connections you have. And so if you can volunteer and spend time in a museum, the chances are you're going to bump into somebody who knows somebody who can get you in that door, who can show you and help you to become where you want to be and take you perhaps on one of these things and, and go in the mountains and having a look for dinosaurs. So I think that was some, some gold dust there in the, in that of, of what to do. If you're, if you're really interested in dinosaurs, you've got to spread your interest. You've got to get interested in other things, which most people, most children are, to be honest, but most children I speak to that are into dinosaurs also are into rocks and, and geodes and, and that sort of thing. So they've got that natural instinct there. Um, and then get into the museums and volunteer and then learn. And then as you get through high school and into college, then you need to be studying where you're going and then what you're going to be studying when you get there. But yeah, that's, yeah. That's, definitely, that's definitely the track. Yeah, just keep that interest. Yes. That's the pattern. 
like a lot of people like when they get older they're like i'm not interested i'll do something easier you know <laughs> and so um, it's keeping that passion sure. and a lot of it's just kind of luck too is you get keep working on stuff you'll you'll stumble upon things um many paleontologists i would say about half of the paleontologists out there have day jobs um they they have another career um and but they do paleontology on the side um so they may <clears throat> they may have a job that pays a little bit better but then they have their summers free maybe a school teacher and then they go out and do field work so and it's like, it's like a hobby it's like a like a yeah yeah so yeah. it's not it's not their main form of employment, but it's something that they love doing. Like you know, everybody has something they love doing, um, and you can turn it into something that's that's you know, it, it, there's a career eventually if you wanted to go that route. So that's yeah, fantastic. definitely, definitely. And and you know, like I've seen um, career trajectories where people are really interested in art and they're really good artists and they love di drawing dinosaurs yes. and they just keep working at it, working at it, working at it, and they get better and better and better. And pretty soon they get a commission to do like an art mural or something. And they'll get into the paleo community and they'll present, they'll have their little business card and people will then be like, oh, I saw that mural is really beautiful. You should hire this person to do this work. And so then they get into the field as, you know, from outside. So a lot of it's networking, a lot of it's meeting people. Um, Paleontology is a pretty small field, and so when you get to know everybody in the field, um, they will kind of hint at some some opportunities that are out there. Sure, um, there are a lot of resources nowadays on the internet um, to kind of track down some paleontologists, and feel free to email or contact a paleontologist you learn about. And you're welcome to visit my website and email me if you have any questions about careers in paleontology and that's a really good way i so many paleontologists get inspired by contacting paleontologists and being kind of excited when they write you back um and 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 so that connection is really really powerful so you know when you visit museums ask about you know the researchers have a conversation with the person that may be in there prepping a bone or something sure. like and you'll kind of learn and and of course there, there's there's lots of different characters out there so you have to kind of uh, you'll meet some paleontologists that are kind of stick in the muds yeah. <laughs> and you'll get uh, you'll get other paleontologists that are super friendly and sure. want to chat for hours. So, yeah. <laughs> well, I must say thank you so much for, for being so open and so friendly and encouraging people to contact you. Um, you know, you're not the first person that I wrote to. Um, but uh, you're certainly the, the person that came back with the, the, the most positive attitude. Um, and I've got some other people that I'm going to be speaking to, but it was really, really special for you to come back because, you know, you give in to these kids that are really, really interested in dinosaurs. Yeah. And as I said to you, they, they see someone like you and say, that's what I want to be. Uh, and they'll ask me, how do I get there? And I honestly don't know, which is the reason that I wanted you to come on so that you could talk to us and tell us all the ins and outs. And, and exactly. you know, like it's not, it's not all Indiana Jones. There is a lot of work involved, but, but it's those, it's, it's like fishing. You can sit there all day, but when you, that, when you hook that fish or when you find that bone or, or you discover that thing, that's the magic. That's the thing that keeps you coming back. Am I correct? Definitely. And, and, there are, I'll, I'll tell, because when I was a kid, my mom was very concerned that I was interested in paleontology because she's like, there's no jobs in paleontology. And you'll hear this repeated. There are no jobs in, you cannot make your living looking for dinosaurs, um, but you can. There are, there are career opportunities in paleontology. And actually we kind of need, I think we need more paleontologists because it may be difficult to find a job, but having that interest and that passion, I think is really important. Um, especially nowadays, everybody sits on their computers all the time. And yeah. so um, being able to go out and observe the natural world and, and make new discoveries, I think, are even more important today. There was an old paleontologist who we used to work um, at the museum, and he would get mad at people sitting on their computers because you come by and be like, you should be out there in the field finding new fossils. You're not going to find any fossils on a laptop staring at it all day long. And we would all kind of laugh, but he was, he was right. A sure. lot of it's getting out sure. and exploring and stuff. So, yeah. um, so we need more people to get out there and, and, and uh, explore and, and uh, discover new fossils and stuff. So we, we can learn more. So, and there's amazing discoveries being made every day too.
uh, that are out there as well. So. That's that's something I, I I constantly when I go to schools and and libraries and do little shows with our with our puppets. Um, they're not real, but we don't tell anyone that. Um, we I'm, I'm constantly the kids are and the parents are surprised when I say look. We don't know all the dinosaurs. We're, we're discovering roughly one a week at the moment. You know, it's like we're constantly. So when you guys grow up, you could be the person. You could be the one that goes out there and finds the new dinosaurs and name it and, and do all that sort of thing. And, and, and you can see the, the the eyes in the kids widen up and they're like, wow, they can really see it happening. You know, it's yeah. uh, and there's amazing discoveries that are made by kids too, going out into the field um, as well. Um, and so there is there is definitely the possibility of finding something if you keep your eyes open. Um, and if you do find something, you know, find out who the person is you should contact who owns the land and let them know. Um, oftentimes, if you're working on like public land, like a park or something like that, find out who owns the land and let them know you found something because you could be at a playground and there's a hillside and you'll start finding stuff. I took my daughter to a playground in Denver once and there's like a little hillside and went up to it and it's like, there are some triceratops teeth coming out of here. So <laughs> you can find really cool stuff. And a lot of, a lot of the, a, a lot of North America has rocks that are of the Mesozoic age uh, where you can't, there is a possibility of finding uh, dinosaur bones and, um, and oftentimes it's in weird places. You wouldn't necessarily think of being really, you know, an important fossil bed. Um, but if you just keep your eyes to the ground, you'll eventually start, they'll start jumping out at you too. So yeah, fantastic. definitely keep searching. That's fantastic. Is there, is there anything you're working on at the moment or anything you want to tell us about before we say goodbye? Um, let's see this. Um, I'm working on a couple of projects. Um, I'm, one of the really fascinating things that I've been working in um, recently in the last few years has been the event that led to the beginning of the age of dinosaurs. So looking at the end Permian extinction event, which occurred um, about 252 million years ago, which kicked off the age of dinosaurs. Um, dinosaurs live in the Mesozoic era. So they, they, they become, they start to arise during this period of time after this mass extinction during the Triassic. And the other thing that happens during the Triassic is there's, there's this huge kind of experimentation with a lot of the diapsid and synapsid reptiles that were living at that time. And dinosaurs are one, just one of a bunch. But by the end of the Triassic, um, there's another big extinction. And that extinction kills off all the competition with the dinosaurs so that by the beginning of the early Jurassic, the dinosaurs rose to dominance. And they got they started getting big and and monstrous and super diverse. And the other animals, the little diapsid lizards and uh, the mammals, they all kind of got really small and shrunk <laughs> down. So one of the really fascinating things is is what caused the end Permian extinction. And the other really fascinating thing I find really fascinating is the end uh, Triassic extinction. So what was going on at those two periods of time? And one of the really fascinating things is uh, from evidence that we've been gathering, uh, both of those extinctions are probably related to volcanism that was happening, uh, that was causing the climate to get really hot. So at the end of the Permian, there is a massive volcanic eruption in Siberia and just called the Siberian Traps. And it's just a huge, uh, big, huge, massive eruption. And at that time, uh, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere increased quite a bit. And that caused the climate to get really, really hot. And it killed off a lot of animals that were living in the oceans. It killed off a lot of animals living on the land because it got really, really hot. In the Triassic, in this new desert environment, uh, after this global warming event, is where the dinosaurs start to take off. And they're, they start doing pretty well, but then there's another major global warming event at the end of the Triassic. And that one is caused by the um, Atlantic Ocean starting to split apart and all of the volcanism along the Atlantic region that's going to separate North America and South America from Africa and Europe. And those eruptions cause another global warming event. So things, things get hotter again. 
and you get massive deserts that start to spread across the, the, the earth. So a lot of the beautiful sandstone deposits that are here in Utah that you see, um, many of those are deposited during the end Triassic and beginning of the Jurassic period. And one of the things that made dinosaurs so successful is they could live through these global warming events and live in the deserts. Um, they have very upright stance. They could run. They were quick. Uh, they weren't like the other um, uh, reptiles and mammals that kind of suffered during those extinctions. So during the Mesozoic period, during the lush period of the Jurassic and Cretaceous and things kind of calmed down a little bit, um, you, you have the return of the forests. You have the, the, the return of uh, and the beginnings of angiosperms, the flowering plants. And during that period of time, dinosaurs got big. They had food now. Uh, you, you, get, you get up to the point you get to the Cretaceous, things are warm and tropical and wet. And so you don't have to worry about those big, massive deserts like that, that actually kicked off their evolution. True. So dinosaurs were really successful during that early period of global warming at the end of uh, the, you know, in the Triassic period and at the end of the Triassic. And that's what made them successful. And so I'm always kind of fascinated with that, those events um, in the geological time scale, um, because it, it kind of relates to some of the things that are happening today uh, with global warming. So I'm interested in like how uh, not only dinosaurs, but other animals survive through those events um, and what, what made them successful and which were the animals that didn't make it through that, that suffered. Um, so it's, that, that to me is really fascinating yeah. as well. Yeah. It's, it's just endless, endless unanswered questions, isn't there? It's just like <laughs> you get to one thing, well, would that happen? What happened to that? What happened to this? And what about that? And what about that? It's just, <clears throat> like you say, if you're detective minded, if you're somebody who asks questions and looks for answers, it's a fantastic career. <laughs> it really yeah. is fantastic. Well, I wanted to say thank you so much for your time today. It's been inspiring. It's been interesting. Uh, I'm sure the kids are going to take a lot of it, a lot of stuff out of it. Um, and I wanted to thank you so much. And and um, I'm sure, uh, well, I'm saying I'm sure, I'd love to have you back at some stage um, and we can discuss other things that are going on and, and perhaps, you know, narrow it down onto something smaller if if you'd be willing. But it's very kind of yeah. you to have spent your time with us. Oh, this is, this is a lot of fun. This is a great setup and it's just really fun to talk about dinosaurs with people who are interested in it, for sure. Yeah, good, yeah. good. And the guys, let me put your website up here so the guys can find your website here, benjamin-burger.org. Okay, it's .org. Um, and that's yeah. where to, to find you. And you've got, I know I was looking at some videos and stuff you've got up there. I think I was watching one, it may have even been on Twitter, about Triceratops. Um, and so for you guys watching, uh, Benjamin spends a lot of time doing lots of stuff and lessons on there, all about dinosaurs and, and prehistoric yeah. life. So um, it's a great place to go and look. Yeah, you can check me out on uh, YouTube as well. So I have lots of videos on YouTube and just search under Benjamin Berger. It's just Benjamin Berger dash science. So, but it's, you can link off my website as well. So, I got yeah, you. lots of cool stuff up there. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. And um, I'm sure we'll see you again soon. Thank you so much. Oh, thank Bye. you so much. Take care. Well, how about that, guys? Wasn't that absolutely amazing? I want to say again, thank you so much, Benjamin, for spending your time with us. It was uh, incredible. Absolutely incredible. Now, there was a lot of information that we um, handed over there. There was a lot of stuff about what to see and what to look at and how to research. And then there was the whole, the whole job career thing that we talked about, you know, how to get into paleontology. So much so that I bet you missed a lot of it. I know I did. I've listened to it four or five times and I still can't get all the information out. So what I've done, I've got something special for you. Have a look at this. Alexa, play the Dinosaur Experience podcast. Playing the Dinosaur Experience podcast from Apple Podcasts. Here's the latest episode, interview with author of Dinosaur Children's Books, Barbara Pinka. Hello, my young dino friends. This is Ranger Martin talking to you from the Dinosaur Experience. Now, if you want to... Wow. Go to her website. How about that? Yeah, so we are not... <laughs> so I'm trying to get into your... 
mind and so that you can see us wherever you are. So we've got the live broadcast, we've got YouTube where you can come and find us, the Facebook page in the group. Now we're on a podcast, we have our own podcast. So it's ideal for those school trips in the morning when you're on the way to school, on the way home from school. If you want to listen about dinosaurs, there's two episodes up at the moment. Um, and you can you can actually see those there. Let me just bring this picture up. All right, so this is what you're looking for. It says the Dinosaur Experience podcast. If you look for us in iTunes or Spotify, we're trying to get on to, um, to Google Podcasts. That will come up in the next couple of days. They're still checking us out. But at the moment, we're on iTunes and we're on Spotify. And then the others will trickle in as it goes. Um, as they come along, they'll, uh, they'll all, you know, be automatically fed to two episodes at the moment working on the third one um, and it will give you something to listen to another place that you can find the dinosaur experience all right so let's have a little look around the web and let's have a look at some of the places you can find us so this here is our website the dinosaur experience.com um, you can see it up here the dinosaur experience.com Lots of stuff on here if you want to talk to us about birthdays, if you want to talk to us about coming to your school or a summer camp. But what I want to show you is if you click on more here, or you hover over more, first one I want to show you is the TDE Kids Live Shows. That's what we're doing at the moment. So if you've missed the broadcast, this is where you can find all of our broadcasts that we've ever done. Yeah, Here's last week's, and then number 15 will be up there uh, in very shortly, almost as soon as we've finished. But also, when we when we touch on more, we come down to the very bottom here, and now we've got a new page that says podcast. All right, and so this is where you can listen to the podcast if you don't have iTunes or you don't have a your own you know um, RSS feeder on your on your phone or whatever. Um, this is somewhere you can come and listen to the podcast. So the first one we've got is the interview that we just had with Benjamin. Um, that's the interview with the paleontologist, Benjamin Berger. And then the second episode here is the interview with Barbara Pink, um, who's the children's author. It tells us all about her book um, and the dinosaur. So that's the dinosaurexperience.com. Uh, this page here is our Facebook page, the Dinosaur Experience. So you can find us there and you can see here's our live show currently. Um, and we put stuff up here about you know, any birthdays we've been to, that sort of thing. That's the dinosaur experience. This is the one you want to join, okay? The dinosaur experience for kids, okay? You can join them both, doesn't matter. Um, but this is the one where you can add things to. We're up to 744 members now. It was about 720 last week. So that's really good. Um, and this is where you can see all the things we've got going on. Obviously, this is our live show. It's slightly delayed. Um, we've got the um, Jurassic World Dominion trailer, which dropped the other day. That's there if you wanted to watch that. This is the um, you know a, a kid's toy that I, I looked at the other day that you might want to watch the video. And I always put up a shout-outs thing here. So if you want a shout-out on the show, like today, for example, there's two ways of doing it. You can put your name in here when we do the shout-outs on the Facebook group. Or you can actually put it in the comments as we're actually doing it. And I can see there's there's a few, a couple there that have already done that. So that's the Dinosaur Experience for Kids. Okay, that's the group you want to join. And then the last one I want to show you, there's plenty of them. But the last one I show you is this. This is our, face, uh, sorry, our YouTube page. Look for the Dinosaur Experience on YouTube. And please subscribe. We've got 58 subscribers. I'd like to get that up. Um, and this is where everything goes. So all of our live shows are here. Rexy's Tales, where we read stories to Rexy. Party ideas, how to make some party stuff. Um, this is where the videos from the dinosaur parties go to. And then we've got lots of what they call shorts, which is like their version of TikTok. Um, and all the uploads are here. So anything that we've done, that we've uploaded, will come to our YouTube page. That's really worth looking at. Um, you can follow us in other places. You can follow us on um, uh, Twitter, for example. Uh, search for Ranger Martin on Twitter. Um, you can find us on TikTok, The Dinosaur Experience. Look for us there. Um, basically, any social media. L LinkedIn, you'll find us on LinkedIn. All of them, you'll find us. And, and we appreciate you following us. 
All right, guys, I don't want to be around forever because I know we've been on a long time. We normally try and keep it to about 30 minutes. We're already over an hour. So our, our riddle of the day, what is so fragile that just saying its name will break it? Any answers? I don't think we've got any in the comments. Nobody guessed it. All right, so the answer is silence. All right, what is so fragile that just saying its name will break it? You break the silence when you speak. When you say silence, you've broken it. That would be the answer to that. Okay, so uh, just a quick mention now. We might do more on this next week. But yesterday, yesterday, the Jurassic World Dominion um, commercial dropped. Okay, it's early. I thought it was coming out for the Super Bowl on Sunday. But it actually dropped, was it yesterday or today? Today, I think. Um, two things that really, really, and if you haven't seen it, go to the Facebook group, the Dinosaur Experience, and the Dinosaur Experience for Kids group. The video is there. The link to it is there. Just hit it, and it will show you it. I can't show you it on here. Last time I showed um, something on here from Jurassic World, uh, Facebook cut off the feed and, and stopped me going live because they, it, it was copyrighted. Um, so you'll have to click on the link and then go to YouTube and watch it. Anyway, the two things that I wanted to talk about. First one, the top picture up here. Blue has had a baby. Okay, there's a little baby blue. How exciting is that? Um, that's really, that's another thing that's going to take us on. And the bottom picture here, can you see that? All right, so we've now, it's guaranteed we have um, feathered dinosaurs. Okay, and we talked before, when we've talked about dinosaurs, how we now know that a lot of them had feathers. This guy, I believe it is a, a pyroraptor, um, and we'll probably do a lesson on him in the next coming weeks. Um, but if you watch the, uh, the video, the Jurassic World Dominion uh, prequel, he's a scary animal, let me tell you. And I'm telling you, the film looks amazing. I can't wait for it to come out. All right, guys, we're wrapping up now. Um, just want to say a few shout outs, as we always do. So let's have a little look on here. So um, Barbara asks us to shout out for Simon. Simon is her lead character, one of the lead characters in her book, The Magilicious Journeys. OK, you remember we interviewed her, I think it was last week, um, and she's written some books. So go to Barbara Pink with an E. Dot com. Have a look on her website. There's a link there that will take you to her books and her Kickstarter. You'll be able to see all about it. Also, listen to our podcast and all the details are there. The interviews there. So that's for Simon. Uh, another one, Emma. Emma, he's four years old, and her mum Casey here. Um, she also is in the comments. Hello, Casey. Thank you for commenting. Emma, you are incredible. There's a video on the uh, dinosaur experience. The kids group um, of Emma telling that going through a book and she knows every dinosaur and there's like I'm, I'm not joking there's 30 or 40 dinosaurs in there it was absolutely incredible her knowledge is is second to none so Emma I'm very very impressed I'm really looking forward to meeting you a uh, couple of others Dan yeah hey Dan <laughs> All right, buddy. Yeah, I saw you um, put your thumbs up there. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. And Tony as well. Hey, Tony. Thanks for the thumbs up. I really appreciate it, guys. All right. Um, just to say we've got some really, even more, really, really exciting stuff we're working on. Um, if you live in the Hammond area or around Hammond, we've got something special for you guys coming up in the summer. And, and I'm telling you, we're pushing the boat out on this. It's it's bigger than anything we've ever done before. So um, keep your eye out for that. It's coming in the summer. Um, working on a real special video for some special people uh, that I'm hoping that maybe be out next week. I'm hopefully going to be doing a live broadcast for school teachers so that we can talk to you guys um, and tell you about what we can offer as well. Don't forget, all our details are on the dinosaurexperience.com. You've been a great audience. I hope you've enjoyed the show, and we'll see you all next week. Bye-bye.